Happy sunny Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host, all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting May 4th, 2015. I've had a busy week of lots of stories, so let's start with the daily security bites. On Monday, I'm talking about Uber account hijacking. A while back, Motherboard released an article talking about how some UK customers were experiencing account hijacks, where a criminal had uh, logged into their Uber account and used it. Now, at the time, there were rumors that perhaps Uber had been hacked or their network had been breached. Motherboard is updated with a newer story today saying that there's been some instances of U.S. Uber customers also having their accounts hijacked. However, there does not seem to be a Uber network breach. Here's what's probably happening. Some attacker has probably used some of the stolen credentials from other breaches, and he's probably written some sort of script or tool that tries the those credentials against Uber. And because people tend to use the same password everywhere, the attacker is probably having a pretty good success rate logging on to Uber accounts using other stolen credentials. Anyways, the moral of this story is very simple. Uber probably hasn't been hacked, but if you're using the same password everywhere, you could be. So be sure to use different passwords wherever you go online. Really, right now, the easiest way to do that is with a password manager. And on Tuesday, I'm talking talking about some new malware with some unique destructive capabilities. Cisco's Talus Research Group released a post about the Rombertic malware. On the surface, Rombertic looks pretty similar to most malware. It tends to arrive in a spear phishing email as an attachment that pretends to be a PDF but is really actually a screensaver file which can execute code on your computer. And if it does infect you, it's going to actually take some control of your browser so that it can steal information that you put in your browser like credentials and things like that. However, under the surface, Rombertic is very interesting and it's showing how malware is getting more sophisticated to evade both legacy and more modern defenses. Now, it's hard to talk about what Rombertic does without getting into the weeds, but essentially one way to catch malware nowadays is sandboxing or advanced threat protection, where rather than relying on a signature to detect malware, you actually put it in some sort of virtualized sandbox environment and you pay Pay attention to the malware's behaviors to see what it does. Well, Rombertic uses many new and interesting methods that try to evade sandboxes. First of all, a big portion of uh, Rombertic's code is actually dedicated to benign images and legitimate looking functions that Rombertic actually never uses, but are placed there to make it harder for a sandbox system to recognize it as something bad. Another very common thing malware does to get past a sandbox is it knows that analysis systems can't wait for a long time. So malware tries to pretend to sleep or wait for a long period of time before actually doing something bad. Now many sandboxes like WatchGuard's own APT blocker through LastLine can detect many of these sleeping methods. Rombertic, however, while it does this sort of delayed waiting method, it does so in a really different fashion. It actually just does a worthless computation over and over again uh, for a period of time. But since it's actually doing something, uh, some sandboxes may not detect that as sleeping. But most important of all, once Rombertic really infects your computer, it does this one check where it basically checks the checksum or it checks the validity of a particular payload running on your computer. And if it detects something is off, perhaps because of an analysis environment, it gets very aggressive and it actually overwrites your hard drive's master boot record, basically making your computer unbootable and causing you to potentially lose data. And even if the malware doesn't have enough privilege to actually uh, erase your master boot record, it at least encrypts all the files on that particular computer, very much like ransomware would. So this is very destructive malware and quite interesting. 
Now, what can you do about this? Well, first of all, with any destructive malware, one of your biggest security tips is just a general best practice. Do you have a backup of your most important data? Obviously, you want to prevent malware from entering your network, but there is no guarantee in this life. So you should always have backups of your most important data. Now, another very useful tip is signature-based antivirus is not good at catching evasive malware. You need something that uses some sort of behavioral analysis, things like advanced threat protection, such as what we provide at WatchGuard with APT Blocker. Now, this malware is specifically designed to try to evade even sandboxes. This will always be a cat and mouse game, but sandboxing is going to be the only way to detect some of these behaviors and catch them. The final thing is to understand some of the subtle differences between network-based and host-based security. There are advanced threat protection or sandbox environments that run on your own computer. There are also sandboxes like our APT blocker that run on your network and intercept and analyze malware before it actually gets to your employees computers. Now if a sandbox were running on your user's computer and this file Rombertick got on their computer and it overwrote the master boot record, you've lost your computer. The good thing with network-based protection is we are running this file somewhere else. If Rombertick actually detected the analysis system on this network-based or cloud-based advanced threat protection system, that's the system that would be affected by the destruction, not your own personal computer. So that's just one pro in this case of network-based security controls over host-based security controls. So just to recap, be sure to back up. Make sure you don't just rely on signature-based AV. You need advanced threat protection. And finally, there's a lot of benefit in having both network and host-based security. And Wednesday's story is Microsoft is killing off patch day. If you're in this industry, you surely know what Microsoft's patch day is. It's a cyclical monthly patch day. Basically, the second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft releases all their patches for their products. The theory behind this was that by giving you a regular time to know when patches arrived, more administrators would patch regularly. Now, when this first came out, a lot of skeptics like me pointed out that this could be a security risk too. For instance, if a bad guy released some zero Day right after patch day, it could take a month to actually get fixed. Now, in my opinion, this didn't really play out in reality. While there were times that zero day did come out, in the cases of very risky threats, Microsoft actually released out of cycle releases to fix those as well. Anyways, all that aside, Microsoft had their Insight conference this week, and during it, one of their VPs, Terry Meyerson, announced that there would be no longer a a monthly patch day. Rather, for Windows 10, Microsoft plans to release patches whenever they're available. So this is quite a change. Now, I don't really know how or when this will play out. I don't know if this is a Windows 10 only change and if there still will be patch day for old versions, or if this means that you could get security bulletins and updates all the time. In any case, I think it's very practical information for IT administrators. You should keep an eye on this because it could affect the way you patch your Microsoft systems. Now, I do know that they still plan on having automated patches. If you're using automated patches, of course, those work seamlessly. That said, folks patching business servers and things like that tend to want to sometimes hold off on patches until they test them. So Microsoft plans to have a business version of patching as well. Anyways, to recap the takeaway, if you're a Microsoft administrator, the monthly patch day is gone, at least for Windows 10. So you want to keep an eye on this news and figure out how you're going to do your patching in the future, because you definitely need to keep uh, up with the latest patches. For Thursday, we're talking about more vulnerabilities in Lenovo software. You probably remember a while ago when I talked about Superfish. This was some additional software that shipped with Lenovo devices. It turns out to be adware because it would redirect your browser to ads, but worse yet, it suffered from a vulnerability that pretty much compromised the integrity of all your SSL connections. Today, IOActive released details about three vulnerabilities in more of Lenovo's pre-shipped software. In fact, the vulnerabilities affect the software update service Lenovo uses to update its own software. Two of the flaws are elevation of privilege uh, issues. Basically, if I can log into your Windows computer even as a low-privilege user, I can exploit these flaws to gain full control 
control of that computer. The big one, however, is a remote code execution flaw affecting the software update tool. Basically, the tool uses SSL TLS, a secure communication, to accept its updates, but it doesn't fully validate the trust chain of a certificate. So basically, a bad guy can sign malware with a specially malformed or fake certificate, and the update tool will take it. Now, to do this, the bad guy has to do a man-in-the-middle attack. He has to get into your traffic somehow but it is a pretty serious vulnerability. Now, the good news is Lenovo's released a patch for this already, so you can go get it. However, a better tip might be not to use OEM providers pre-ship software. If you work in an IT organization, it's pretty common to re-image your laptops. When you do, I recommend you use a clean installation of Windows that you've configured yourself. And on Friday, I want to talk about how WatchGuard actually catches the latest evasive malware. Over the past few weeks, you've heard me talk about different ways you can catch malware. Signature-based detection versus sandbox detection. Now, of course, sandbox detection is essentially when you create a virtual fake uh, victim system environment and you run unknown files through it and monitor its behavior to see whether or not it's bad or good. And sandbox detection is really the only way to catch the latest zero-day malware. This Wednesday, I talked about Rombertic, the latest version of Evade of malware that uses a lot of sophisticated evasion tricks. For instance, like a lot of malware, it pretends to sleep for a long period of time, hoping that uh, automatic analysis systems won't catch it. But even the way with which Rombertic sleeps is kind of specific and kind of different. As well as that, Rombertic uses a number of other things to try to detect a sandbox analysis system. Well, good news for customers that have WatchGuard's APT blocker service, we actually are not tricked by this evasion. Our sandbox comes from one of our partners, LastLine, and I have confirmed with them that they are able to catch the Rombertic malware. And it gets even better than that. Lately, there's been some additional variants of the dire variant of malware. This is another information-stealing Trojan that's out there. Dyer uses another trick designed to detect sandboxes. What it essentially does is look for how many cores or CPUs your computer has. And most modern computers tend to have multiple cores, whereas if you set up a virtual environment, the virtual machine tends to only use one virtual core. So this is just another interesting way that malware is trying to detect if it's running in a sandbox so that it can alter its behaviors. And again, good news, this is another variant that LastLine has confirmed that we can catch this particular evasive behavior. And that's why I love our APT blocker product so much. It is really, really good at catching evasive behavior. By the way, if you want to know more about how LastLine catches this evasive malware, uh, they posted a great article which I'll link in the blog post associated with today video that shares some interesting details. Anyways, if you're a WatchGuard customer and you haven't tried APD Blocker, I highly recommend you give it a spin. Hey, that's all for this week, but there were tons of other stories out there. For instance, new WordPress Zero Day, some interesting cybersecurity politics in Congress, and lots of other stories like that. So if you're interested, be sure to go to blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com where I post the link associated with this video. It contains a section full of lots of references to other interesting information security stories. And where else can you find us? Well, of course, you can go to Twitter. You can follow me, at secad adept, or you can follow at WatchGuard Tech. And finally, if you want to get the videos quickly in case I don't post the blog immediately, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Well, that's all this week. I hope you have a great weekend. And as always, here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.